viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan facing global sanctions for harboring and financing terror. India at UN expresses concern on recruitment of children by terror groups. And security forces in Jammu and Kashmir burst three Lashkar terror modules. Amidst the ongoing economic and political crisis, Pakistan continues to support terror. For several years, Islamabad has been extending its moral and financial support to various global terror outfits. This is the reason that it continues to be on the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force. FATF has declared that the country will be removed from the list only if it successfully passes an on-site visit where the terror financing watchdog will assess if it can sustain its reforms on terror financing and money laundering. A report. Since the 9-11 attacks by Al-Qaeda against the United States, Pakistan remains at the core of global terrorism. It not only remains a breeding ground for terrorists, but is also a financing hub for global terrorism, despite facing stern warnings and sanctions by the international community. Though Islamabad pledges to fight terrorism, the existence of global terror outfits in the country raises questions over its commitment. The recent decision of the Financial Action Task Force, or the FATF, at its June 2022 plenary to keep Pakistan on the grey list, once again reiterated the global community's reluctance to trust Pakistan on its commitment to remove terror from its soil. The FATF's grey list is reserved for those countries that require additional monitoring as they are suspected to be involved in terrorism financing. The fact that Pakistan is a terrorist sponsoring state, that it has supported terrorism both against India and into Afghanistan uh, is very well known, very well documented across the world. Uh, they are on, uh, terrorist organizations in Pakistan are on uh, terrorist listings of America, Europe, uh, uh, the United Nations, a variety of uh, countries as well, other countries as well. So there's no, no doubt about Pakistan's role. According to the latest U.S. Congressional Report on Terrorism, Pakistan is home to at least 12 groups designated as foreign terrorist organizations. Notably, several of them included in the list target India. They include Lashkari Taiba, Jaish e Mohammed, Harkatul Jihad Islami, and Hizbul Mujahideen. Despite Pakistan's name routinely popping up as a major global terror hub, the FATF remains hesitant to designate Pakistan in its blacklist, which is reserved for countries that are hubs for terror financing and money laundering, both of which remain prevalent in Pakistan. The Independent Congressional Research Service went on record in its report that Pakistan-based Lashkari Taiba was responsible for major 2008 attacks in India's Mumbai city, as well as numerous other high-profile attacks. Pakistan's deft ploys, crafty diplomacy, and skilled manipulation of banking records has thus far hoodwinked the financial watchdog's rating system, with multiple FATF deadlines passing for Pakistan to comply with safe and trusted global banking practices. The FATF uh, grey list does not have teeth and very clearly the international community has never been willing to actually act against Pakistan even when Pakistan was supporting terrorist organizations which were killing American forces in Afghanistan, killing European forces in Afghanistan. So I don't think the world has the will to really act against Pakistan sponsored terrorism. Even though Pakistan has avoided the FATF's blacklist, its current status in the grey list has taken a detrimental toll on its economy. Pakistan's continued support of terrorism has shaken the world's confidence in Pakistan's economy, and this has trickled down to hardships faced by its people. Frustrated by its failures at fomenting trouble in India, Pakistan is using all tricks in its book to unleash violence in the country. But the vigilant Indian security forces have been successfully trotting all its mischievous agendas. 
Recently, security forces busted three terror module in Jammu and Rajori district and recovered several arms and ammunition from different locations of the region. A report. Unveiling Pakistan's devious agendas in Kashmir, Indian security forces unmasked lashkar e taiba terror network and arrested seven terrorists in Rajouri and Jammu districts. Numerous guns, ammunition and explosives were seized from various places throughout the Jammu province as a result of the terrorists' confessions made throughout the inquiry. Security personnel busted one module in Jammu and two other modules in Rajouri district. Three terrorists have been apprehended, one each from Jammu, Samba and Katwa districts in connection with Jammu terror module. Pakistan-based lashkar e taiba terrorist Bashir Shezan of Doda had set up the Jammu module by activating Faisal Munir of Talab Khatikan area in Jammu. Munir had four to five more boys working with him. This terror module was responsible for receiving arms, ammunition and explosives airdropped in Jammu by drones from Pakistan and transport them to park back terrorists in Kashmir. They had received more than 15 drone sorties of arms, ammunition and explosives during the past two and a half years. Kashmir has been uh, the target of Pakistan always and Pakistan has been sending infiltrators into Kashmir to spoil the peace in Kashmir and uh, targeted killing of civilians and the policemen in Kashmir is a way of uh, uh, you know, troubling and disturbing the peace in the valley and this is uh, increased especially after the abrogation of article 370 and uh, uh, this has to be stopped and the secure and uh, the defense forces are taking strong steps to stop it while on one hand pakistan talks big on crackdown on terror and peace in the region on the other the country is leaving no stone unturned to disrupt flourishing grassroots democracy and development in jammu and kashmir according to a report of ministry of state for home affairs 128 security personnel and 118 civilians were killed by park back terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir from August 2019 to July 2022. However, Indian security forces are thwarting all their devious agendas. As another report of the ministry reveals that there has been substantial decline in terror attacks in Jammu and Kashmir from 417 in 2018 to 229 in 2021. In which Pakistan-based terror groups lashkar e taiba and jaish e Muhammad suffered the maximum casualties. While 63 LAT terrorists were killed, 24 terrorists were eliminated from the JM group. Security forces in Jammu and Kashmir have so far this year eliminated 100 terrorists. Of the total terrorists killed, 71 were local, while 29 foreign terrorists infiltrated into India. Pakistan needs a severe blow, and only then it will understand that sending terrorists to India is, uh, is going to give very, very bad results to Pakistan. Firstly, Pakistan should be declared a terror country at the United Nations. Secondly, Pakistan should be uh, banned by the entire world for sponsoring terrorism. And India needs to take very strong steps. The Indian Defence Forces need to take strong steps in shutting down the terror training camps across the LOC and teaching Pakistan a very, very strong lesson. Despite all the embarrassment and name-calling at various global forums, Pakistan continues to use terrorism as an instrument of its state policy. In a sophisticated world where the other countries are looking forward to establishing peace, harmony and developing new technologies, 
for the advancement of the world settlement, Pakistan's state policy of terrorism is causing violence and is creating an environment of distrust in the world. Residents settled near the border areas are living in constant fear due to frequent firing along the border from the Pakistani side. Pakistani army generals who are the real masterminds behind most of the terrorism across the globe believe that the world won't notice their devious plans. But to their surprise, not only all of their diabolic activities are being monitored, but being given a befitting reply by the Indian forces. Children continue to suffer disproportionately in most situations of armed conflict around the world. They remain most susceptible to suffering and are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of armed conflicts. Recently, addressing the UNSC high-level open debate, India stressed the need for ending impunity for all actors inciting and perpetuating grave violations against children in armed conflict situations. Take a look. In many parts of the world, children are among the most severely affected victims of terrorist attacks. Thousands of children are abducted, recruited and used by terrorist groups. Because of their young age and psychological malleability, children become particularly dangerous instruments in the hands of those exploiting them for the purpose of committing criminal offences. There is no single part to recruitment, but once associated with terror groups, children are subjected to multiple forms of physical and psychological violence, including forms of torture and cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment. They are often injured or killed in combat. Recently, at the UNSC high-level open debate on children and armed conflict, India expressed concern on the rising number of children recruited and involved in terrorism-related activities and termed it as a dangerous and worrying trend. The debate came a week after the report of the Secretary-General on Children and Armed Conflict, which mentions that over 25% of child casualties were caused by mines and explosive devices. A dangerous and worrying trend in global terrorism is the rising number of children that are recruited and involved in terrorism-related activities. For terror groups, children are more susceptible to manipulation whether as active participants in terror or as human shields to protect the perpetrators of terror. School closures due to pandemic have been misused by these terrorist groups to target children, including through online avenues for radicalization and indoctrination in violent extremist ideologies. There is an urgent need for a more coordinated approach in implementing the child protection and counterterrorism agenda. The school closures due to the pandemic have been misused by terrorist groups to target children, including through online avenues for radicalization and indoctrination in violent extremist ideologies. India has stressed on the need for ending impunity for all actors inciting and perpetrating grave violence against children in armed conflict situations. We recognize the importance of having sufficient resources and requisite number of uh, child protection advisors in peacekeeping missions for effective implementation of child protection programs. The Council should consider incorporating adequate child protection provisions and capacity in all relevant mandates of UN peacekeeping operations. There is also a greater need for constructive engagement with respective national governments in the formulation and implementation of uh, child protection action plans which is integral to uh, sustaining durable peace. It is important to build an enabling and conducive environment to ensure holistic development of a child with special focus on nutrition, education and safety. Children who grew up in conflict and post-conflict situations often need a fresh start. 
Therefore, there is an urgent need to strengthen legal and operational tools for child protection. With the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan, what security officials and analysts feared the most appears to be coming true already. The rise of terror groups reinvigorated after Taliban's victory. Foreign terror groups enjoy greater freedom in Afghanistan than at any time in recent history. And with that, living conditions of Afghan women have deteriorated drastically. When the Taliban group came to power in August last year, women television journalists and other professionals were asked to leave and stay at home. Human rights activists who spoke against the rule were killed or disappeared without trace. Afghanistan has once again become a hotbed of terrorism after the Taliban takeover. A UNSC report a few months back revealed that Al-Qaeda retains a presence in Afghanistan in the provinces of Ghazni, Helmand, Kandhar, Nimruz, Paktika and Zabul, where the group fought alongside the Taliban against the ousted government. The report also claimed that slain Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden's son visited Afghanistan last year. It further revealed that Amin Muhammadul Haq Sam Khan, who coordinated security for bin Laden, returned to his home in Afghanistan in late August last year. The Taliban, which often refers to the Islamic State of Khorasan as its worst foe, while in reality, the two organizations work together to foment terrorism in Afghanistan. According to the report, Islamic State Khorasan or ISIS-K is recruiting fighters from the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement and the Turkestan Islamic Party, among other foreign terrorist groups. It aims to position itself as the chief rejectionist force in Afghanistan and to expand into neighboring Central and South Asian countries. Recently, the European Foundation for South Asian Studies, an independent think tank on South Asia, organized a conference, Situation in Afghanistan and Future Trajectories for the Region and the West at the European Parliament in Brussels. Mr. Bashir Ahmad Gork, a renowned journalist, expressed his concerns on the situation of growing terrorism in Afghanistan after the Taliban takeover. Taliban takeover has uh, encouraged other militant groups uh, and they have encouraged uh, extremists uh, to go further and uh, radicalize the youth as much as possible. The future of militant groups and how could the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan affect the wide region is also a very good uh, uh, discussion point to have at this point of time because uh, we have seen evidence that the Taliban are using uh, the Islamic uh, state uh, of Khorasan as a blackmailing chip uh, uh, when they are talking to the international community. And they say, for example, if they are not there, the Islamic state will go on and they have a, a wider agenda and they will try to attack uh, Europe and uh, other countries like they have done before. So you should talk to us and you should uh, give us money and you should recognize us, the Taliban are saying, that uh, we are the ones who uh, can control them. Since the Taliban seized control of Kabul last August 2021, there has been a severe political crisis in Afghanistan, which has been accompanied by deteriorating living conditions for the country's women. A number of human rights activists, journalists and critics spoke out against the killings and human rights abuses in the war-torn nation, particularly against the country's minorities. But their voices have been shut by the Taliban. Whole towns have been forcibly moved and people who spoke out against the Taliban organization have been killed without a court order or disappeared without trace. Not only that, according to UN experts, there has been an upsurge in violence against women and girls, especially cases of underage marriage and trafficking of girls are on the rise. 
the all male interim government is steadily erasing women and girls from public life in Afghanistan, including in institutions and mechanisms that had been previously set up to assist and protect those women and girls who are most at risk. Taliban took over last year in August 2021. Hundreds of thousands of Afghans, mostly professionals and educated, were forced to flee the country, particularly women, in horror of reprisal against them. While the number of attacks against human rights defenders, women human rights defenders, journalists, and critics have been dramatically increased, and many of them were forced into confession by the Taliban simply for peacefully demonstrating or expressing their views in a, in a very peaceful manner and demanding their fundamental rights, particularly rights to education, rights to employment, and rights to political participation. In, 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 in the past few months, the number of extrajudicial killings enforced disappearances, particularly detention, and torture is at highest particularly against former members of the Afghan military forces who laid down their weapons and started a civilian life. The Taliban group whose leaders include several designated terrorists seized control through force and is intended to impose its extreme ideologies on common Afghans. It is willing to reverse the modest advancements in gender equality and education that have been accomplished over the previous 20 years. Further, it has not demonstrated any sign of accommodating minority communities that are not Pashtun or Sunni. Yet the Taliban regime wants international recognition as a legitimate government of Afghanistan and wants the world's assistance to tide over its difficulties, including its devastating earthquake. The Taliban group must realize that just as the world is rushing to help with humanitarian assistance for this natural disaster, it can hardly stand by and watch a Taliban-made disaster unfold. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.